Dean. Uh, my background is really in music from a creative point of view of music. I was involved in the music scene for a long time and I had released three albums and by, by 2012, I sort of had felt uh, it, it creatively sated, I thought. You know, I'd done a lot in music. My children were young. My day job was getting busier and busier. So I thought I'd take a break from creativity. Um, but what I didn't really appreciate was that creativity is not something you can, it's not really to do with what you do. It's to do with the way your mind is made up. So about five years after thinking I'd taken a break, I got these very strong flashes of the character who would become Leonard. So this gentle, quiet, youngish man who had a vague sense of melancholy about him. And I think the first image I had was the image of him coming in from work, slightly sighing and taking off his shoes with a toe from his back foot, taking off the heel of his front foot. An image which I later used for Hungry Paul, actually. That was the first image I had. And I said, I would try and get to know this character. And I had a diary. Every, every six months, the presidency of the EU rotates and Malta had the presidency. So I had a Maltese diary that I got through work. I'm a civil servant. <clears throat> and when you get a new diary, you always think it's so, so full of possibilities. There must be so many diaries that just have the first two or three days filled in. So I, I said I'd write something about this character every day till I got to know him. And then after about two days, I said, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to try and write a novel. <clears throat> because one thing about writing novels is nobody can really stop you. <clears throat> and also you don't need a drummer, which is great. So I, I decided I would, you know, once I started to write about this character, he started to take form very quickly. And I, I wrote the book quite quickly. And I wrote when my children had gone to bed. So I would sit down about 10 o'clock at night, write till midnight or half past midnight. And I did that about six nights a week for about three months and wrote the first draft. So that, that, that's how it came about. And what about Hungry Paul? When did he appear in your mind? Well, I, I quickly figured out that, I suppose, first of all, a character like Leonard wasn't going to be able to carry a book on his own. He, he wasn't um, a leading man. Uh, and I also realized that to try and understand a character like Leonard, I would need someone to draw him out, someone he could express himself to, a sort of Leonard only more so. Uh, and I, I, I began to see it then as a novel about friendship. Uh, and Hungry Paul took shape. And as I went through the book, it's funny when you're writing a character, you know that it's an authentic creative project when the characters really start manifesting in the book. So you go, you begin by saying, this character, Hungry Paul, I'm going to give him these characteristics. And usually you make the mistake where you give them too many characteristics. Uh, and then after a period of time, you go from that designing a character to really listening for the character and really picking up. So, so Hungry Paul became a sort of foil for Leonard and a way of drawing him out. Uh, and the novel really moved quite quickly into a novel that had a friendship at the core of it. And why Hungry? It sounds rather more animated than he is some of the time. Well, the, the first thing I always point out is that only the narrator calls him Hungry Paul. None of the characters ever refer to him by name. So I wanted to give him a, a title that would mark him out as a character who was worth paying attention to. But I didn't want the descriptor. I didn't want something that summed him up. So you would never say, when you go to Ket's books, which one is Chris? Oh, Chris is the hungry one. You'll know who he is. You know, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Hmm. But at the same time, in the book, there are, I tried to take away all the signage. So there are no surnames. There's no specific location. There's no specific time period, other than it should feel like it's set not far from here and now, wherever that is for the reader. There are very few physical descriptions. There's very little in, in the way of idiomatic language. And that's because I wanted to focus on human nature uh, and, and the aspects of human nature that are easily overlooked. 
And if you put those signposts in, I know that people would use them to take a shortcut. In other words, rather than spending time with the character and getting to know them on their terms, people would like to uh, use these signposts, which we all do in real life. But for this story, I just didn't want to do it that way. And I felt that, you know, had I ended the book by saying, and that's why it's called Hungry Paul, I felt <laughs> I would have been in some way legitimizing the idea that you can sum somebody up, that people are not as complex as they look. So that's why I didn't explain it in the book, but why I still used it. And in the evolution of the novel, at what point do you start thinking about plot? And I, I'm interested in the point because you start with character. Last year, our author for One Community, One Book was William Shaw, who's a thriller writer, and plot is everything there. Mm. Plot seems rather subsidiary for you. How did you weave the two together? Very good question. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a plot-driven novel in the conventional sense. Mm. What I'm, I'm very much, and I actually wrote an article on this that, that was published earlier in the week. Um, I, I, I'm a great fan of what I would call reflective novels. So in other words, they're not driven by cause and effect. They're not built around conflict and resolution. What they are, what they work on is uh, realization and self-awareness. Uh, the change that's brought about in Leonard and Hungry Paul is by the characters understanding themselves better. So it doesn't, it's not a response to external events so much. And I'm interested in that because I think it's, it's full of, it can be full of insight as a state that people try and understand themselves and they identify with their situation. Then they go into change and they very, because humans are so adaptable they then identify with their new situation. But in between, they're in a state of flux. And if you slow down that transition and observe it under a microscope, as it were, you can actually learn a lot about people and about yourself. And so in the type of book it is, I wasn't, I didn't plan out the book, I didn't map it out. I always knew where I was going to be in a couple of chapters time and I had a vague idea how it would end. Um, but I only pl plotted it in the same way that you might plot a day on your holidays. So, you know, you might go to Paris and you'd say, well, I'd like to go, go to a nice restaurant. I'd like to see the Louvre. I'd like to see the Eiffel Tower. But I'm not that fussy whether we see them on Monday or Wednesday or, or you, know, we do, you know, as long as we get around to it before we get out of here. So the book is kind of like that. You know, I, I wanted, there are certain things I wanted to touch on and explore, but I left it the natural sort of, unfolding of the novel uh, take its own course. So, so like William Shaw, who, who I'm sure had spreadsheets and you know has to be very, very tight and disciplined uh, about a novel, that style of novel writing. When you're writing a more reflective novel, you have a bit more space. Although you have to be careful that you don't, it's not a license to write boring prose. So you have to be careful of that too. But you do want to know what happens next. I think particularly about Leonard's relationship with Shelley which develops very positively. And then there are her anxieties about Patrick and Leonard's about his own inadequacies. But when he talks to her in the reception of the wedding, you are on tenterhooks to know how it's all gonna go. It really does matter to the reader, you are engaged. It is, you know, the plot takes over in that sense. Yes, it, it, to say that, that it doesn't, uh, hinge on plot is not to say that there aren't moments of importance in the book uh, and that, the, the, that, it, that it is not working towards something. I think in, in Leonard's case, there he is dealing with a few things. He's, he's, he's dealing with grief. He's adjusting to a new way of being in the world where he is the generation that's it. And he's also still, he still keeps within him aspects of the curiosity and the awe of life that children have. And he has this intuition, I think, that, that that's valuable in adults and perhaps forgotten in adults, but how much of it to use. He doesn't really understand the world, the rules of engagement. So he stumbles a bit with Jelly, but I think ultimately he realizes 
that he has some faith in himself uh, and he realizes that fitting into the world is not about figuring out the rules and trying to learn them and apply them. Uh, it comes from sort of self-understanding and he has a breakthrough that enables him then to see himself more clearly and then present himself more clearly to Shelley. And that um, speech of his, well, no, it's not a speech, that reaction of his to Shelley, asking her to take him as he is, as it were, to understand him as a person, that he can't act, that he can't pretend to be something he isn't, is a very central thing for the book, it seemed to me. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there is maybe a, a strange thing for a book to promote, which is that words aren't everything. You know, there are people, and we see them in politics all the time, who can say the right thing at the right time. Uh, and there are many movie scenes built on that. Uh, what Leonard is saying is, I can't, I don't have that spontaneity, but what I can offer you instead is authenticity. So what I will say is, whatever I do say, I will mean. Uh, and his appeal to her is to not set artificial tests that he will fail, but to judge him based on what he can do and, and what, what, who he is. Hmm. And her reaction, we'll see, nonetheless is encouraging, isn't it? I mean, it's unresolved, but I think the reader comes out being optimistic about that. Yes, and I, th I think what happens with, with Shelley is that she, she, she takes a risk in, in the same way. I think she, she sort of having, she's better at the rules of the game than he is, but she sort of lays down her rule book as well. Uh, and she realizes that what, what, what draws her to Leonard is that sort of authentic, that sincerity, I think. Hmm. Uh, and she realizes that her coping mechanisms don't stand up under that sort of sincerity test and that you can only protect yourself so long, but it's actually diminishing for a person. For, it doesn't nurture their, their inner self if they are continually in, in that mode and she needs to sort of relax into their relationship and uh, have, a, have a degree of trust. To some extent, all the characters in the book, I think, are people who have developed coping mechanisms that get in some way disrupted in the course of the book and they have to find a new a new way of dealing with the world. And she's no different. Yeah, she uses Patrick as a shield, doesn't she? She she is reluctant to engage with Leonard because she is using Patrick as a as an excuse for reticence, for holding back. I think she I think we all it, it's a it's a natural thing to do in life is to make a role for ourselves. Uh, and to define ourselves by those roles. But that approach to life has its limitations. Uh, she, she's obviously protective towards Patrick. She's unsure she has had, she'd had negative experiences and she's never really come across someone like Leonard before. And I think what happens with her is that I think her protection of Patrick is sincere, but she does, I think, confront in herself that there's more going on than that. That with, with Patrick, she has to come to a point where she has to accept her own attitude towards relationships and she has to take steps. You know, you, you sometimes you just have to take that risk and have to take that forward step in your life. And she has found legitimate reasons to defer that. And now she's in a situation where she doesn't take a step, she's going to lose, lose somebody she cares about. So she takes the step. I enjoyed a lot of humor in the book. I mean, I just listed one or two of them, but uh, you know, the, the Rose's chocolate saga, the job of being a spokesperson for the Mime Association or the new look at Munch's The Scream, the title of the um, Paul's parents' house, Parley Vu parlay view it should be of course i'm not making it clear is that you coming through or do you think that's something that the characters developed you know one thing when i was writing the book um that i thought would turn people off is the omniscient narrator 
we, which is not a fashionable thing at all. It's considered quite a 19th century thing these days. Um, and, but I liked having fun with the narrator. You know, I, I liked, bear in mind, I, I'm, I'm 45. My children are, are 10 and 12. So they're constantly telling me I'm not funny. So it's, it's nice to sort of sit down uh, at the end of a day and bear in mind, you've no expectation that you'll be doing Zoom events with readers or anything a couple of years later. You're just really expressing yourself. To sort of sit at the laptop, just making yourself laugh for a couple hours before bed is actually a really nice experience. <laughs> and so, so I was just sort of like a child playing in a sand pit. Uh, and I just, you know, I wasn't trying to write a comic book as such, but I didn't stop myself either. I just sort of felt it naturally sat with the atmosphere of the book, you know, that it, it I think a book that's about sort of silence and sort of the peaceful side and the gentle side could easily become, you know, quite a, an overly serious book or maybe a lack, lack flavor. So it's nice just to put humor. And humor is such a part of life. You know, you get people together. One of the first things they'll do is somebody will crack a joke. So I just, I just allowed myself the freedom to do that. And it naturally came out that the narrator's sense of humor, I think, was able to harmonize with what the characters were saying and uh, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that side of the book. One of the reviews said this is gentle people finding their way in the world. Given that, and given that it's not in a conventional sense a page turner, were you surprised at its success? Very much so. Very much so. Like wh when I was writing it, I didn't think it would be published. You know, not because I didn't believe in it, but just because. I didn't see how the elevator pitch worked. I kind of thought you'd have to spend about an hour in an elevator to sort of talk through the book before somebody would get a sense of its appeal. So I suppose what I'm discovering about the book is that the things that it emphasizes, you know, the value of kindness and the, 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 the great value of gentle people in the world and the, the unheralded and unchampioned goodness that's in everyday life, that people recognize that, they've experienced it, they've appreciated it, uh, and they're enjoying finding that in a book because so often books focus on dysfunction or they focus on uh, drama and conflict, which is understandable from a sort of dramatic writing point of view, but real life doesn't have as much of that as perhaps literature has. So I think, what, what I sort of, in it sort of found its way in the world quite gently because we didn't have a marketing budget. Like our marketing budget was zero. So it's really relied on readers discovering the book for themselves and passing it on. So it's been a pretty, it's had a pretty, you know, natural or organic journey in the world uh, that people just keep discovering it. And I think that's probably appropriate. A book like this, I don't think would work with a big marketing splash, you know, billboards on Times Square or anything like that. It wouldn't seem right. So it's been nice that people have, it's resonated with people uh, and they have just found it. The truth is that in all of our lives, it's often the small events that make, mean a lot to us. They alter how we feel day by day. So exploring these with, with Leonard, really rings home. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And when you look at what life is made up of and the bits that matter, it's interesting, actually. I, I often notice when when people pass away, like celebrities and stuff like that, often when people pay tribute to them, they talk about how kind they are. Uh, and it's something you don't often hear living people say about each other, unless it's a wedding speech or something. You know, it's a lot of kindness is expressed in private. Uh, and in a way, it's a binding force in society. But also, as you say, the, the everyday, what makes up life, the little observations, the little details, the habits, the routines, and how relationships are made up of those things. You know, they're not made of, up of the, the Hollywood moments. Most, of, most relationships are held together by the everyday interactions and just being around you know, caring enough about someone just to be around with them. And the book, there are a few technical things in the book. For example, there are a couple of rest chapters in the book. 
where nothing happens and you're really just spending time with the characters doing nothing because that's what we do with our friends that's what we do with our family we just hang out when it was accepted by a publisher and and you went through the process of editing did your editor make you make many changes no the the, the, the book i submitted is, is is pretty much what's published what what happens with my editor is a, a woman called lynn webb um, Lynn is uh, 73. She's a former professional wrestler. Um, so she doesn't take any messing. Uh, and, and, what, and she has this turn of phrase that she used, which is a gentle prompt where she'll highlight something and say, not up to your usual standard. And that's a polite way of saying, this is no good. So she will what really what an editor like that does, it's not that they will look for structural changes in the book. They're really trying to emphasize the book's strengths, look at the consistency throughout the book and look where maybe something is overwritten or doesn't quite hit the mark. So, but I did a lot of editing myself before. I went through probably two dozen edits before I submitted it. So uh, you get to a point where you do need somebody to look at it afresh. Uh, and we have a rule, a, a sort of, uh, an informal rule between us, which is that my, I say to my editor, she's allowed spot problems, but she's not allowed to find solutions. So in other words, she's not allowed to put a word in or put a sentence in or rephrase anything, but she's allowed to highlight something and say, I don't think this works as well as it could when you have a look at it. In a moment or two, I'm gonna hand you on to Tracy to deal with some of the questions that have come in. But could I just ask you a couple of other things quickly? A few words about Penenka, the next novel, which seems to be very different. Yeah, Penenka is, <clears throat> you'll see it's in the screen behind you, there's a copy of it there. So Penenka comes out on Thursday. Uh, Penenka is a 50 year old man. He has reconciled with his estranged daughter and lives with her and her seven year old son. And Penenka carries a lot of pain and sadness in his life. And he faces some real challenges. So what, what the book is about really is normally when we have problems in life, we try and solve them so we, can, so we can move on. So the book really is about how do you find peace in your life when your life is unfixable? And at heart, it's a, it's a platonic love story. And my last, slightly different question is that you were involved in a lot of music making previously under the name of Mumbling Deaf Row. How did that come about? Well, the name is because I was a fan of various blues musicians like Mississippi John Hurt and the Reverend Gary Davis and Blind Boy Fuller and Blind Lemon Jefferson. So the, the guitar player in my band christened me with that as my blues name. <laughs> Uh, so that's where it came about. So that, that's where that title. But yeah, I was involved in the music scene for about 20 years, uh, released three albums. And the last one was nominated for the Choice Music Prize, which is the Irish equivalent of the Mercury Music Prize. Excellent. Thank you. Now over to Tracy. Thanks, Chris. Hello. Um, Ronan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the, the One Community Project, as hopefully all of our uh, readers and viewers know, is meant to give us a single book so that we can all have a conversation. Um, even people who don't read the book will have become so familiar with it from seeing it that they will be able to join in the conversation. We have actually started seeing that happen. And we've had great chats in the bookshop about what questions people would want to ask. And I've been sitting here worrying quite honestly because between you and Chris you have covered nearly everything on my list that I was going to ask you about so I want to thank our um, volunteers and readers and customers who have sent in questions that have already been answered so Barbara, Sheila, Chris, um, Catherine, Annette, um, Lorraine, um, they were great questions and great discussion and um, there are a few more though so Tell us about the birds, the bird play, the bird tables in the book, Ronan. There are several references to it. Uh, I, I love it. It's small details, small bits of life and take our attention away from the bigger story. Do you have any thoughts about the references to birds in the book? This is from M. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a lovely question. And actually, I've, I've, I've never been asked that before. So that, that I'm really, really glad that's been asked. Um, the, I have great fondness for birds myself. I'm not a bird watcher, but I do enjoy feeding the birds in my garden and paying attention to them and watching them. And I feel it's a really good training in, in kindness because the birds never knock on the window and say, listen, thanks very much. That was great. I really enjoyed that. So they, they don't give you any uh, particular recognition. So you do it and you do it just for the pleasure of doing it. But in the book, it almost acts as a, as a marker of when the characters are in touch with their lives and when they're not. So when they're in touch with their lives, they're filling the bird feeders, they're paying attention. Other other times when Grace is busy and she's trying to keep everyone happy and she's trying to keep herself sane, her bird feeders are swinging there, cobwebbed and, and empty. So it's just a little marker throughout the book of how people are in touch with themselves <clears throat> or in touch with their lives. And it also, I think, gives it just a sort of symbol of sort of peace and nature in the book. And, and it works really well. And uh, just from the beginning, it's on the first or second page, isn't it, where Leonard's mother is described as um, being so kind that the only excuse for someone, not, assuming that the only excuse anyone would ever have for not having a bird feeder, feeder in the front garden is that they have one in the back garden, that just it is clearly from the beginning a, a measure of one's human capacity for kindness. Um, I tell, I tell people actually, look, just take this book, go in the corner, read the first page and you'll be hooked. And it's, it's worked really well because people do get such a, a sense of the book straight away. Um, now we also have um, from Eliza, a question about what books influenced you. This ties into something I wanted to ask about as well, because you said to us when we interviewed you for our YouTube channel that you learned to write by reading. So what books influenced this, please? That's a really good question. I, I'm, I, I don't think there was a particular reference that I had in mind. You know, I think it's definitely influenced by me coming out of a decade of reading children's books. Uh, you know, and I wrote it on my kitchen table surrounded by children's encyclopedias and board games. So my imagination didn't have far to look. But also I think when, you know, if you think of Shirley Hughes books, for example, the Alfie books, you know, a depiction of domesticity, happy family, families, are, most families are trying to be happy, you know, and I think maybe as a parent myself, I'm maybe invested in that idea. Uh, and also I think the sort of, there is a Winnie the Pooh-ness to Hungry Paul, perhaps. Uh, and I think there's uh, also in terms of the structure and narration and the sort of fact that it's not located anywhere. So I think it's influenced by children's books. Um, I think I'm also, the last time we spoke, we, we spoke a bit about my interest in Japanese literature. Uh, and I think that has been an influence because one thing that uh, I, I read quite a lot of Japanese literature. And what I've always found is there is a sincerity there. It's a lack of cynicism anyway. Uh, and there is a gentleness to, the, to it. And perhaps structurally, there's less of the sort of urgency around drama and conflict that allows you to kind of walk around the characters in a sort of 360 degree way as if they're in a freestanding sculptures and you can look around them. So I think those influences are all there. I try to read uh, in a, a, and as non-deliberate way as possible. So I don't make notes when I read books. I usually get confused about the names halfway through books, but I just let the book sort of wash through me and have its effect, try and season my outlook. So I think it really sort of came from that, a, a mix of all those things. I can definitely see some resonance with the, the Japanese literature because there's a stillness in them that, that seems to be in common. Um, now, I hadn't thought until I was preparing for tonight very much about the narrator, and I hadn't spotted that it's only the narrator who calls Paul hungry Paul, but he said he's almost, he or she is almost like a character in themselves, and they have an attitude of, I, I can almost imagine them as being Japanese, just being still and accepting and a, 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 a funny Japanese person telling the story. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of these decisions around narration are intuitive. You're, you're, you sort of launch into it. Um, and I think from, again, going back to where, where I was coming from, where, you know, when your kids are young, reading is, is the idea of somebody reading you a story is, is, is how, you, how you experience reading at first, you know, before you can read yourself. So I think maybe the idea appealed to me of a narrator who was sort of reading us the story. Uh, and almost in the same way that a parent will have a child on their lap and will say, look at this fish, you know, where's, where's the teddy bear? You know, what's happening here? Let's see what's on the next page. We are sort of guided through the book. Uh, and I think that was probably in my, ringing in my ears a little bit with the, with the narrator. I think it also let me join in a bit as well. That, that's what I liked about it. I wasn't on the outside of the book. It wasn't just all about them. It feels a very safe narrator that, they, that they, as you say, that they're holding, sitting on the same type, side of the table as us, looking at the story with us. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, so Chris mentioned about the plotting with R William Shaw, but one of the things that William Shaw talked to us about is that he started with the landscape. He, he saw this landscape in Dungeness, that it was bleak and gray and wild, and he started thinking about who's going to live there, but there's no landscape in your book and there's almost no setting, but it still works. Um, do you have any thoughts about the setting? Um, Emma asked about this. Yeah, like I, I would think of the book as if, if William's book is a landscape, this is a portrait. Um, so that, that's what I would say. So that's I, that's a really good way of putting it. I like it because it does allow us to put it anywhere where we might be and to relate to it. Um, we won't have very much longer to talk to you, but one th other thing that I wanted to, to mention or ask about is just how perfect a fit this book is to an independent publisher, because you explained how you didn't really know how to pitch it or what to do with it, but you sent it to Blue Moose. And if this book had gone to one of the corporate giants with the very tall towers in London and, and the um, swish parties with lots of wine around, I don't think it, it would have been inauthentic and insincere. So I think it was a brilliant move and really exactly the right publisher for the right book. I, I just appreciate it on another level because of that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And Blue Moose has done a really good job and a very sensitive job in every aspect of the book. The, as well, Leonard and Ruby Paul are kind of outsiders. So it's nice. I think I think I, I, I would be very uncomfortable if it was heavily marketed as a fluffy uplift book. Mm. Uh, and I can tell you one thing, had it been and the big publishers did try and buy it. You know, they all made offers to come in and buy it. And you know, I had the conversation with Kevin where we, we just turned them down because it was just not what I'm about. It's not what Blue Moose are about, and certainly wouldn't suit the book. But I can tell you one thing, there's no way they would have let me write Panenka. You know, they would, they would have wanted Leonard and Hungry Paul too, or certainly something like it. Yeah. And they, they probably would have wanted me to, to, uh, to sell you all the same book over and over again. I um, agree with that, actually. Yeah, I'm not very far into Panenka. Um, yeah, but I, I agree, it is completely different, but the, there's still, the, the humour is still there. Like, how do you pronounce the, the character who's in um, in the cafe, um, whose name is spelled B-A-B-A? -B -A? Baba. You, you say it Baba, do you? Yeah. Right, okay. I just had to ask because as I'm reading it, I wanted to hear it correctly in my mind. Um, Tracy, before you wind up, can I ask one last question? Ronan, um, Tracy's going to wind things up in a moment, but I just wanted to ask one last question because I'm staggering to understand how life works for you. If you work all day as a civil servant, come home and deal with your children, then write from 10 till half past 12, when do you find time to read? Well, I, I read, uh, if I, I'm working from home these days, but I wasn't then, so I would read on my commute, on my lunch break, uh, I would read it the weekend, but also what I what I like Leonard and Paul. I would work for three months and then take a month off, uh, and then go back. But when I'm not when I'm not writing, 
I still dedicate that time to reading. So I do read a lot. Uh, and it's, I think it's, it's very important if you're writing to schedule reading time to make sure you get through it. And I've, you know, one of the, one of the actual, it's a really good question. One of the tiring things about writing is that you're not reading as much as you'd like. So I don't like to have long stretches of writing. Uh, you know, for a couple of months is fine where I can, you know, still read, you know, 50, 60, 70 pages a day, even, even if you're working at night. But the, um, when, when, you're, when I'm not writing, it feels so nice to immerse yourself back in reading. Like I was doing, I, I was judging the British Book Awards were announced yesterday and I was judging the best debut. And I've, I've also do reviews for the Irish Times of translated fiction. So for the last couple of months, I've been reading for those two sort of jobs, if you like. And the last, for the whole of May or the end of April into May, I was able to read stuff I'd been looking forward to. And it's been just absolute heaven just to pick up a, a book where I didn't have to have an opinion on it. I didn't have to assess <laughs> it and I could just lose myself. So I've been reading, uh, I spent the last few weeks really mainly reading uh, stuff from Croatia. There's some really good on the Balkans in general. Um, there's a lot of writers there I've been looking forward to getting stuck into. So I've, that's been a, a you know, real joy. But it is a struggle. Sometimes you hear, you hear writers saying, if they're working on a book for a long time, they, you know, they don't get to read much at all. So um, I think I'm going to have to, like, because I've got a, quite a busy life, I'm go, I've actually, the next book I've pushed out by a year. Because I, I, don't, I don't think I'll be able to keep going at this pace forever. <laughs> so I think I need to, to slow down and maybe, maybe, maybe write more at weekends and take more days off, I think. I'm breathless just listening to you. But then finally, I hand you back to Tracy. So we round things off. Thanks very much. So this is our first Zoom um, live author event. Um, so thank you all for your patience while we were figuring it out. I, I would say the next one, we'll be able to have more viewer participation, um, but we just wanted to make sure we could do it. So thank you all for your patience, but we do have a brave person, Catherine, who's, who's put her hand up, I'm told. Is there a question from Catherine? Um, yes, there is. Um, Ronan, um, a, a light question, because I so love being made to laugh and smile throughout the book. I felt you were like a friend. I wanted to, every I haven't quite finished, but I keep going back to the book to be with your characters. And there was one moment where you say he threw um, the water balloon over the privet hedge. Um, and I just wondered, have you done that? <laughs> I, I, I haven't, uh, but I'm sure I have seen my children do it and elected not to interrupt them. <laughs> it's just such a delightful image. I, I loved it, uh, as with uh, piercing the plastic with the pen in the, in the not so super supermarket. And uh, so many of those things made me think I must go around life laughing more and enjoying those little things. And my little grandson said to me, I never laugh at school. No one laughs at school. And I said to him today, Alfie, try and have a laugh. And he gave me the littlest look as if to say, oh, good idea, you know, Granny, I'll try and laugh. And, and, and you, you really have made me want that humor and that sort of observation, the details is just wonderful. I absolutely loved it. And also love the paper and the print. You've chosen such a, a wonderful quality of book to hold. Yeah, lovely to hold, very nice. Thank you, Catherine. Well, yeah, it's quite one thing, when I, when I was working on the book, uh, Blue Moose were actually the first publisher I sent it to. Um, and uh, one thing that really appealed to me is that their covers were lovely, the quality of the print was lovely. I bought a couple of books recently. Um, I'd waited till they came out in paperback and I got them and they're on that sort of grotty uh, gray sort of paper. And when I'm reading it, it's really spoiling my enjoyment. So uh, yeah, I, I love the feel of them. And it, it's, it's a, I, I love the tactile side of, of book reading and yeah, it's great. So thank you very much, Catherine, lovely to hear that. All right, thanks very much, Catherine. It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in the shop properly yet, so it's nice to see you. Um, so speaking of seeing, if all the travel restrictions are lifted and if you're able to travel, Ronan, if you are coming to promote 
Panenka, please come by here because we would all love to see you in person properly um, to come back and help us to spread the word about our One Community book because we think it's the perfect selection for Wyndham and for this year and well for any time. So thank you ever so much for being with us now and being alongside for our whole year. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure, Tracy, and thank you. And thanks, Chris, and thanks to everyone for, for taking part. It's a real honor when I think when you write a book uh, and you don't think anyone will read it, and then you get to sit down with people who read it so open-mindedly and open-heartedly, it's, it's a real privilege for, as, from a writer's point of view. So, so certainly if we all get back to normal and travel's permissible later in the year, it'd be lovely to, to call in and see you all. We can't wait. Right, okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. You know where we are, you know our phone numbers, you know our email addresses, keep in touch. We're all friends and we can't wait to see you one way or another. So take care of yourselves and enjoy your reading. Good evening, everybody. See you. Bye. Bye.